Hello there everyone. It is time once again for Faust to be making his trek across Strang Lake. I want to spend some of my souls and get my adaptability up some because I want to start getting a few more iframes. Turns out I have just enough to get myself up to that 95 agility breakpoint. The next 100 points should be the most important ones. Let me just check how many. I have two fragrant branches of yours, so that's nice. That means I can clear the full shaded wood without having to stop for anything. I still have yet to grab a, an alternate secondary weapon, but I am hoping that I can get something from the little Lion Clan warriors. Their great axe, of course, is a quality weapon and a great weapon, so that would do quite nicely. I actually found a great love for the great axe on one of the strength builds that I ran, where I actually focused on using purely the Gurm great axe once it was available. I am actually going to kill uh, Ben Hart right now because his armor would probably look really great, or at least some little bits of it. And I actually think his character's completely worthless. He's very unhelpful in boss fights, and his storyline's pretty crap, so I can just kill him and have all of his armor back at Melentia for if I ever have the spare souls for that. Something I'm going to want to have. I don't really need to bother clearing out both of the uh, side chambers in this ambush first, because the bastard sword has such a sweeping moveset, uh, the group is actually extremely easy to take on even if you have all six alive rather than the four that are necessary to fight all at once. So really it's just no big deal. I am gonna have uh, Rosabeth here head back to Majula because I'm probably gonna want to pick up a few of her pyromancies and use her for upgrading my pyromancy flame late game, but nothing just yet. I'm not going to be using the brigand set this run, and that's... I am going to be using the trousers, so... I don't know. Let's give her some Varangian leggings, because I've got so many of those. And that'll have her pop on back to Majula. And I want to be sure to grab that Estus shard down there. There's, there's actually quite a bit of nice loot here, even though it's just a small area. And it's all the way up here, there's the loot down in that side passage earlier. These guys all have a chance of dropping some really weird weapons, and so I always make sure to grab their drops, even though I'm probably not going to use any of them for this character in specific. Light the bonfire just in case. Only once as this next stretch actually killed me in all of my time playing Dark Souls 2, but it was very frustrating when it happened. I got a little bit cocky, got poisoned by a pair of the little totem corpse wielding of these goblin hollow things. Really can't say for certain what they are, but I, I'm pretty sure that uh, E&B and uh, a German spy actually came out as saying that they were named golems within the internal uh, memos that FromSoft was using, that they actually had a little bit of access to when they were helping with the guide, so I'm I'm pretty confident that I can just call them goblins and that'll do. Come to think of it, I could actually check the uh, Farfire uh, Bonfire webpage that actually lists all these stats for Dark Souls 2 because I'm pretty sure that actually has a list of all the enemies uh, that have been killed and so of course it would list them by the canonical name. Assuming you can take external sources as canonical at all. That is a bit of an intense item of debate for myself. I, I still haven't come out fully in one side or the other. Uh, just because there is the point that you can make that authorial intent doesn't really matter, only what is within the work of media is what can actually be considered canonical. But at the same time, there is quite a lot to the story of Dark Souls 2 that didn't really make it into the game and so whether or not you consider that to be part of the story is really a personal matter especially if you take the lore as seriously as I do it can be 
quite the cause of consternation trying to puzzle out exactly what you deem canon and how exactly it all fits together if you omit certain parts that don't appear anywhere in game but you still have some knowledge of whether it's from uh, people who worked with from software in order to make the guide or just a variety of sources personally I try to exempt as much that isn't in game as possible like I don't consider the actual official guide to be canon even though it is extremely helpful and it has a lot of background information that uh, really fits within the game I still don't consider it canon largely because it was created by a third party and it actually has a lot in there that is more interpretation rather than denotative uh, conclusions just drawn directly from the game itself. It seems like there was a lot of speculation when they were creating the guide and they actually included that within the actual printed copy and that's just something I don't quite agree with. I could switch to the Falcon Shield because it is a small shield with the nice parry frames but it, it looks kinda derpy if you're not running a really royal or more garish looking knight type build. Sometimes it looks pretty nice, especially if you're going to be two-handing and just strap it on your back. But for my purposes, the Varangian's shield just looks absolutely perfect. Really glad I picked that up, even if it did take a lot of farming. But I'm probably going to have to do even more farming here in the Shaded Wood in order to get the Lion Great Axe. It is a fairly rare drop, and I'm probably going to get a lot of their other pieces of armor and maybe even their Great Shield once or twice. But we can certainly hope. I'm considering that I might not want to farm for it just yet. In fact, I might not want to farm for it at all until I've passed my way through, whatchamacallit, the Old Iron Keep and grabbed the Covetous Gold Serpent Ring plus one, so that I can have a better chance at dropping. Is anyone following? Yes. We've got this guy here. There we go. As long as you can get a sweeping hit to stagger them, you can use their health bar to get a really nice lock on their location, but other than that, these guys can just be absolutely terrible to deal with. Especially because some of them have daggers, and so if they can get behind you without you actually seeing them, they can get an extremely powerful backstab that's just going to wreck your health bar. Oftentimes, if I'm wearing light armor or have particularly ho low health and haven't healed up, they'll actually just completely one-shot you. So. That's definitely something I want to be wary of at this moment. I'm considering whether or not I actually want to spend the time rooting around to find the uh, the blue clearstone ring plus one, since it's probably going to be really useful when I transition into a little bit more spellcast late game. But, oh, did he not die? Okay, he died. It's, it's difficult to tell, because it's very hard to discern their death animation but I'm pretty sure that I can just come back here late game when I actually need it. I know that there is actually a layout, a very set layout to this shaded wood, but I haven't taken the time to learn it, so I actually kind of just have to wander... Oh, God. I, I wander around a little bit, picking up all the loose ends here and there, as well as trying to find the chest that's somewhere in here, containing the uh, blue clear stone ring plus one, but it can take some time depending upon just my luck and which directions I actually manage to set myself in. I often find that the best idea with those enemies is just to trade hits, even if you're going to be coming out behind just because you can heal up afterwards and they can oh that that really was a terrible idea on my part because if he had have actually circled around for the backstab I could have been in serious trouble something you might want to consider is bringing either throwing knives or a bow with you in order to tag one of them with a uh, projectile because the projectile will actually stick to them and linger for a while, giving you a much better sense of depth and their location, rather than just 
using their health bar once you've gotten a hit. That's how I would... Oh, did I... There we go. That should be all the drops here, if I'm not mistaken. Right up here is going to be a drop at the very top of the slope and a fire seed behind the ruins over there. And is anyone going to follow me up? Yep. But... He didn't get to hit me just yet. And I can take his damage. There's going to be that one last drop over there, and that's going to be an actual full clear in this area. I usually don't full clear the shaded wood unless I'm specifically aiming to get some of the uh, drops in the middle, specifically the blue clear stone ring. But, you know, I spent the time getting it, and I'm kind of happy with that. I was considering the claymore, but I, I actually would prefer to have the sweeping move set of the bastard sword and its lower stamina costs rather than oh and weight as well rather than the claymore even though I know it's a real favorite for some I personally don't rate it too highly and honestly think it's a lot better in Dark Souls 1 even there I wasn't a big fan though I know that people just go completely gaga over it in Dark Souls 1 so I, I realize I'm kinda in the minority there but Say la vie. It, it happens with things. And when you play the Souls games as much and as long as I have, then you kind of get set in your own little patterns, regardless of what the community is doing. And sometimes they just don't mesh up too well, so that can lead for a little, lead, leave room for a little bit of disparity between the common consensus and how you actually tackle the game. This, this area is one of my favorites just because it really benefits you for playing a pure physical build as well as has a bunch of drops and loot. Sadly I don't have enough uh, fragrant branches of yore in order to do a full clear all in one run but it's not going to be too big an issue I just have to head down the basilisk cave twice. Once in order to actually tag the fangy uh, lion warrior over here, and another time to open up the um, the chamber that's actually holding Orn effects back. Once I actually have, oh, or I could completely ignore what I was doing and mess it up completely. It is a force of habit because usually I come here after doing Harvest Valley, at which point I would actually have enough uh, fragrant branches. But because I used that fragrant branch there, I'm not going to be able to unlock the fragrant branch behind that's in the chest with the lion mage set, which means that I can't actually access that. Whereas if I'd have done it in reverse order, I could have. These guys have very high damage, but very slow moveset, and they're actually weak to physical damage. So backstabs of any real merit can take them out extremely easily just because they're so slow and lumbering and they get locked up in those movesets for so long. As you can see, the backstab just cleaves its health bar in half and that's all she wrote. Those lion warriors are not really a big threat. Human effigy and bleed serum. Some nice drops. Adds a little bit of flavor to the area with the bleed serum there. Showing it's a little bit exotic, a little bit rare. More savage with the bleed damage. It's just a little bit of fun to be had with the drops. Honestly, never going to actually use that bleed serum, just because if you can be buffing your weapon, you probably want to do it with something that's actually going to increase the damage rather than give you a chance at a proc. But that's just my opinion on the matter. Do I have the poison throwing knives? I believe I do. But let's just get some free damage while I'm here. Oh, I also have poison arrows. That's nice to see. Plink, 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 and plink. There we go. I can just leave him aside for a moment as I clear through the rest of the level. Now's the time that I'm going to grab up all the side loot and head down the alternate path to 
see Tark. I'm considering whether or not I want to take him out. And considering that I am still using the stone ring, the second dragon ring is probably a much better choice, and so I, uh, I'm i probably going to kill him right off the bat. I'm, it could be that I might want to save him, but no, now that I think about it, the Ring of Whispers is just a wasted investment. If I could just kill him now anyways, I'll get the Fragrant Branch that I need much later anyways, so it's not like it's something I have to go out of my way for. It's just something that I'll grab when I come back to actually farm this place. Dark Scythe. Uh, very rarely used that weapon, but I'm actually running a side playthrough right now in which I'm focusing on a uh, sort of hexer build, and the Dark Scythe actually does a lot of damage when you're building hex quality. It's pretty great because its uh, actual sweet spot is friggin' immense in comparison to most other halberds, and uh, while it doesn't have the nice thrusting attacks that I love so much, it's pretty great if you're using its moveset wisely. It takes a little bit of adapting to, and you need to be sure you're not getting too close to your opponents, but it is a fun weapon, and it just looks really cool as well. It's very rusted, very big. It's kind of got a similar aesthetic to the uh, Demon Great Machete, but it's nowhere near as primitive. It just looks a little bit evil. And while it may not be as primitive, its moveset is much better. It doesn't have the terrible Reaper type swings, which are just god awful. Like, honestly, the only thing Reapers are good for with their pull in attacks would be bosses. Because they do a lot of damage, I'll admit. It's just that the, the moveset itself is only good for uh, really big single targets that can't do much to get away from you, which basically makes it just a boss-killing weapon. That being said, you probably shouldn't underestimate the damage Reapers can do versus bosses. Things like the Half Moon Scythe or the Scythe of Want will absolutely shred them. But some other of them have really wonky hitboxes that I just don't care to deal with, like the, uh, whatchamacallit, Scythe of Nar Ma, or the Great Scythe, which is just horribly nerfed in this Dark Souls 2. Normally, I could Fragrant Branch him, grab the Fragrant Branch, and then head down, but I kind of messed that up, so I don't have that luxury. It's just something I'm going to have to kind of come back to. Come on up here. It's a little bit weird why this is here. It's, it's just kind of a little side secret. There's nothing much more to it than that. But, eh, I'll take it. Skeptic Spice can be nice, especially because I'm going to be building into a sort of low magic hex build. So being able to spice down the requirements on either Faith or Int on some of the more demanding spells is probably going to be rather good for the character. Dodge on through these acid pits, and double kill. Sweeping weapons are just so useful when you're going into multiple enemy encounters that I just really want to have one whenever I come here. Whenever you've got a thrusting weapon, that encounter could just be the absolute death of you. It's very difficult if you don't have the proper moveset for dealing with it. Orn effects here. She'll move on back to her adopted home, I guess, down in Brightstone Cove. It's it's really weird that you find her there, but given the puppets that can be found within her chamber, I think that it's likely an ancestral home dating all the way back to another age when puppetry was actually an art practice ac across the lands that are now during Lake. Uh, puppetry itself is kind of a lost art at this point, the only remnants of it being the uh, mannequins that can be found in Earthen Peak, as well as the um, bell keepers that can be found in either of the belfries, both Sol and Luna. Other than that, uh, puppetry in general just doesn't show up in Dark Souls 2.
it is interesting to look at the connections there that maybe connect the uh, myth of the baneful queen to um, both the prince and princess of Alkin and Ven, uh, possibly due to the lore implications there, especially because they're the only ones who have any attachment to puppetry and marionettes. And that is something that comes into a little bit more focus when you remember that the Belfry Saul is actually in the Iron Keep. The it coming to think of it, uh that that raises an interesting question for me. Was the Iron Keep built before or after the Iron King took over? Because we know the Belfry Saul is within the Iron Keep, and we know the Belfry Saul is dedicated to uh either the prince or princess of uh, Alkinar Van. I can't remember which exactly is the associations, but considering the Iron King came in after he'd actually ousted Ven, it's a little bit strange to think that he would be the one who built it. Come on, get up. Please? It is strange to think that the Iron King would be the one to have built a monument for uh, the either the lover or the um, actual uh, heir to his defeated foe. So, not really sure what's going on with that. I'm going to have to look a little bit further into that. I know Dave Control Live had a big set of videos regarding the Prince and Princess of Alkin, the belfries and all that jazz, but I didn't actually rate most of what uh, he was going over there. I don't really agree with most of his interpretations there, so I'm going to have to look into that for myself. All I really remember is that there was a lot of stuff going on with trying to determine who and uh, where the... Oh, dear. It's right now that I wish I had a spell parry shield, because... Ah... Uh, those are actually ridiculously easy to parry now that the spell parrying has been buffed so highly. Two more hits should be the death of her. There we go. And that's game, set, match. Time to head on to the Doors of Pharos, the second really lore dense area that we're going to be coming into for Pharos himself this beautiful bastard here. The Doors of Pharos are, is the home of the Gurm. It's an actual underground, uh, I don't know, fort, would you say? I, don't, I can't quite be certain, but it is actually where most of the Gurm coalesced after they were banished from the overworld. The Gurm used to uh, walk the world just as man, but they were banished from the sun as, by men and actually hold quite the grudge for it. I'm not quite sure how that fits in with Gavlan. He just kind of seems to go off and do his own thing. But it is something that we definitely know for certain. We can get dialogues to that effect from somewhere. It may be one of their armor descriptions. I don't rightly recall. But... I'll be sure to look it up and include that in one of the for future episodes. As you can see, they've got just a wonderful drop chance across the board. I've almost gathered enough large Titanite to fully upgrade another uh, weapon, hopefully the Lion Great Axe, if I can get that to drop off camera. Once again, fingers are definitely crossed because that would just be absolutely perfect for the build because it is a quality weapon and a great weapon, it just fits so perfectly. It is difficult to find quality great weapons just because most of the time they're dedicated to one stat or another, whether it's a pure strength axe or it's a pure dex greatsword or some sort of pure strength sword. It, it's just very difficult to get a real in-betweener like that. This little rat maw is really interesting. It, th there's actually one in the Grave of the Saints as well. Tomb of the Saints, sorry. Uh, they actually mark the entrances to the Ratbro Covenants areas. 
Get a vertical chop there. It's nice to see. I don't quite have a very good move set for taking on this Mastodon, but I've got the nice damage for it, so works out pretty okay. Let me see, what's the counter damage on this? Only 120. I would prefer something a little bit larger to deal with them, but oh well. As you can see, I've got six or seven of these Ferris Lockstones, so I can pretty much gather up all I'm going to need here, especially because they'll give you one a little bit later on. So I don't need to be stingy. I can just be sure to grab all the loot that I'm going to want. This here, uh, Santir's Spear, as well as the Faint Stone Twinkling Titanite combo that can be found a little bit later in the level. I did rave about that the first time around, and I'm going to rave about it again, because again, it's it's the first guaranteed Faint Stone you can get in the playthrough. Other than that, you kind of just have to hope for drops. I, I can't quite recall if you can get one from a Twinkling Titanite Lizard, uh, not Twinkling Titanite Lizard, a Titanite Lizard before the Doors of Pharos, but I it, it's not quite coming to me. I don't remember most of the Twinkling Lizards, the Titanite Lizards, except for the ones with really important drops, like the one in the Shaded Wood that drops a guaranteed Bolt Stone, which can be really great if you're making a faith build. Oh, that was bad. Let's back it up. Nope, nope, I don't want any of this. That's one of you down. There we go. They can just be so annoying. Oh, that's a rat tail. That's going to be nice when I finally get myself into the rat covenant. But very annoying, though their drops are rather nice. They can drop ferrous lockstones, rat tails, and the radiant life gem you just saw. I believe they can also drop uh, poison items, but I don't quite recall. Have you just dance around real quick till I can come around behind. I was trying for the backstab, but it didn't want to give it to me. Ow. That would have been a good parry. If he was facing the right way. Three hit combo. Rarely do they pull that out of their hat. Usually it's only two hits, if that. There we go. Lock stone it up. Fall on back down. And we get some Twinkling Titanite. For the trouble. Admittedly, the faint stone isn't worthwhile on this character. But... Twinkling is definitely worthwhile. I, once again, don't have any weapons in mind just yet. So far, it's just the Bastard Sword and the Lion Great Axe, but I'm sure we'll be able to find something later on. Definitely want to get the backstab on him, because... Oh, oh dear. I really don't want him to hit the chest over there since the chest actually holds a Titanite Chunk and Petrified Dragon Bone, which is extremely valuable. Ow. Let's just top ourselves off so we don't have any more problems here. There's only three, not four more enemies, three more Gurm and the last Mastodon before we're done here. Something that really makes me wonder is why exactly there are Mastodons in the Doors of Pharos. It kind of says to me that the Mastodons have gone insane and so have kind of lost all their order. They've just kind of scattered throughout the land and this is the Gurm were the only ones who would accept them. Or I don't really know. It's, it's very strange from a lore perspective why exactly Mastodons, the primal knights of Drang Lake, the first of Aldia's experiments into soul infusion would be here among the Gurm. Even if some of them are locked away, there's the one just milling about in the foyer of the area, which is pretty clear evidence to me at least that... Oh, come on! He didn't even hit, but I didn't get the parry? What is that? Because I know you can parry that if it's one-handed. I've done it before. It's just... Huh. But, yeah. It, 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 there's no real lore perspective I can see that justifies the Mastodons being here in the Doors of Pharos and being allied with the Gurm. 
they are very, very strange additions to the area, and I haven't quite puzzled that out yet. As you can see, this whole area has been just dotted with the uh, Pharos contraptions and a bunch of... It just fits the aesthetic really well. Come on in here, I want to get my decks all the way up to max. I can start buffing my attunement, but it's not going to be worth anything for a little bit longer. Time for just some more vigor and endurance. Start upgrading my regular stats now that I have my perfect quality. I do want to upgrade this bastard sword some since its damage, while it's been nice thus far, is kind of plateauing. I want to get it just a little bit higher. Have a look see through the weapons that I have. I could use the Germax, but it's not quite that good. God, there's just no real quality weapons that are really good for this section of the game. The Halberd is a nice quality weapon, but I don't really think it fits the character very well. And it, it's just not the kind of weapon I'm looking for. I'm looking for a big, large, hulking quality weapon, and so far the only ones I have are the Bastard Sword and Drang Lake Sword. The Bandit Great Axe isn't actually quality at all, since it's just terrible scaling for both of them. Which was why I was really hoping for a Lion Great Axe, but still have not gotten that, so... I'll definitely farm that up before the next episode. Let's see... I do want to upgrade my short bow some, so that I can plink away at the miniature rats that can be found in the next boss fight, just because they can be extremely annoying to deal with in the midst of the fight, because they have their toxic and bleed effects that you just really don't want to be dealing with. So taking them out first off is usually your first priority. Got my iron arrow still equipped. I'm ready to take on the boss fight there in the doors of Pharos. The ordeal's end. I'm surprised I didn't get any rat bro invasions, but I'm actually kind of okay with that. It would feel really scummy for Pharos the Vagabond to be killing his fellow Covenant members, and so I'm actually kind of happy that I didn't get sucked into anyone's world as a Grey Phantom, because I would either lose or just fail. Ah, oh, if only I could get like one or two more upgrades. This would actually one-shot them, but there we go. Now I can focus on assuming the giant castration position. Just get right under him, and you shouldn't have any problems with the fight. Giant castration position has been a thing ever since Dark Souls 1, probably even Demon Souls before that. And it just works so well for killing larger bosses, especially ones that can actually, can actually allow you to get under themselves. Their back legs are extremely vulnerable. And if you can get close enough to hit, then you can deal some good damage. My problem here has been... Oh, dear. That... I, I saw the move after I already triggered the Estus. So, by that point, my fate was sealed. I was going down. It just was not going to turn out well for me. I am interested to see if I use a fire arrow, if I can actually kill those rats in one hit. I'm hoping that will give me the extra damage I'm looking for, since it splits the damage some, but I don't know for certain. The problem with the... Uh, oh, yeah, that's definitely good enough. The problem with the Royal Rat Authority is that his... <clears throat> he's a little bit hard to see the scale on, because he's looks like a smaller rat just with a larger model it can oh I don't even get the healing are you kidding me what is this but because he's just a smaller rat with a larger model it can be difficult to judge the uh, distance between you and him meaning that you can often whiff by not swinging in close enough however if you can get right up to his leg and just start hugging that it's not too much of an issue. Being out in front of him will bait him into that forward attack. 
which is much easier to avoid than the other attacks he has, so can be very useful. That Bile is actually going to play havoc on your equipment if you sit in it for too terribly long, so you want to make sure to get out of that as fast as you can. Now, we're going to take a moment to enter the Rat Covenant. The Rat King here is sitting all smug and pretty, and uh, I'm, there, there's actually something really funny about the duality between the Rat King and Pharos, especially if you actually know what a Rat King is. Yes, yes, yes. Join the Rat Covenant. There we go. You can see in the top left in just a second. There you go. You can actually see a rat embracing a Faro statue. You can see the little hood on the statue on the right. You can make out all the limbs of the rat. Probably even the little eye hole. It's, it's actually quite touching. The crest of the rat is the same design, but it's in much, much lower detail. So it's kind of difficult to see. But it, you can still see the same sort of outline of the two figures embracing coming together. You could choose to buy things from him, but all of it's pretty lackluster. You can get dung pies, you know, if that's your thing, or corrosive urns if you're a jerk and don't like other people. <laughs> but very little of this is actually going to be all too effective. The only thing I could see you picking up with inconsistency is the common fruit if you plan on using the sanctum mace a lot to just reduce the poison buildup rather than any other personal buffs you might want. But that's the Royal Rat Vanguard. As I was saying, there's a little bit of a duality between the Rat King and Pharos the Vagabond because Pharos, being the rotten, as I'll establish later, is a mass of corpses, well, maybe not corpses, but mass of undead, all sort of tied together in a devilish amalgam of just screaming bodies and pain and just all sorts of horrible things. And a Rat King, in reality, there is actually such a thing as a Rat King. It's actually the term used for when a bunch of rats get stuck together by their tails. It can happen from their tails actually becoming entangled or matted in filth or a number of other reasons, but when a bunch of rats actually get stuck together by their tails, it is called a rat king. And since Pharos he is kind of tied into that whole mass of bodies that is the rotten, he is actually a human king by that logic while the Rat King is a human king by the logic of being a very self-important and noble figure with flowery po prose and a deep-seated feeling for his subjects, Pharos is sort of a Rat King in that he's tied together with all of the uh, fellow hollows that are down there with him in the gutter. I'm not sure if that's an intentional connection to be drawn there, but it's it's very, very interesting for me that uh, there's that little connection there. I would like to believe that FromSoft was thinking about that when they actually created the character, just because it fits so well, but I, I can't say for certain. It's just a theory, it's just a little bit of an idea, but it is such an interesting little tidbit of lore. Once I actually intend to do a little bit more with the Rat Covenant. I'll go back and acquire all of his dialogues and actually leave those on camera so you can see where I'm coming from with a lot of the lore conclusions. But once again, I don't intend to be doing that for quite a bit of time. I want to get a nice setup and actually have the proper internet to do some real PvP with the weapons that I'm going to be using on my character rather than just the Bastard Sword or uh, even bring in some stand-in weapons before I can get a nice little repertoire, so I'm not going to be covering that just yet. Something I do want to uh, bring up before I really close out because I am approaching the very end of it here. I'm just going to reach the second bonfire here in the Huntsman's Coffs before I close it out, but Fruit of Cutlass actually brought up a really good point that I kind of had misinterpreted earlier. The Rat King 
does talk about making a deal with humans that the rats would have the underworld to themselves while they would leave the humans alone in dominion of the overworld, the sunlight spattered world of fresh air and all that good stuff, but uh, I did say that it was Pharos who made the deal, which was strange because he didn't actually speak for humanity very much, but that may not actually be the case. I checked through the dialogue a little bit, and I'll be sure to point it out when I come to it, but it never actually names Pharos as the one who uh, made the dealing. Merely that Pharos was the one who sort of restored the Rat King's faith in humanity, which actually leads me to believe that the Rat King uh, was double-crossed by someone before Pharos, and Pharos kind of showed him the good that humanity could do, even though he had already been slighted once by our race. It's definitely just a really wonderful, intricate web of dialogues and inferences and things throughout the game, and I'm, I really look forward to covering that fully when I get there, but it's not yet time. I've got a few more things I need to do. After this episode, I'm going to farm the lion great axe off camera. Probably going to want to, uh, you know, I might not, because if I'm going to be farming, I'm going to want... Of course, well, of course I'm going to want a gold covetous serpent ring. And since I can't get one of those till the iron keep, and I don't actually plan on doing the iron keep until last, I might actually choose to go through the Belfry Luna and actually ascetic it in order to grab the gold covetous serpent ring plus two that you can acquire from killing the Belfry Gargoyles in New Game Plus, or after having ascetic them, so... I haven't quite decided which way I'm going to do it, but... If I show up next episode with a Lion Great Axe, then... Know that I chose the former rather than the latter. And if not, well then I'll probably be heading right on over to... Kill the Belfry Gargoyles, and make sure that... Farming for the Lion Great Axe is... As quick and as painless as possible. Still have to come on around here. This place is nice because it allows you to get a full clear of this little stretch between the first two bonfires all in one go. And of course that is something that I rate highly. Something I really like in level design and really appeals to me as a player. It makes me actually enjoy the level as opposed to the gutter which makes you backtrack several times in order to grab everything which is just very frustrating for me. Several times it just jumps you off at the start, like, oh, that, that was nice, all that progress you made, go do it again. And while it's not quite evil enough to make you actually rest at the bonfire or homeward bone out, it's still a very frustrating mechanic and not how I would like the game to be set up in an ideal world. Come on through here. If you're actually not, sorry, if you don't have a connection to online play, whether it's because you play on console and don't have connectivity or just have really poor internet like I do at the moment, then you can actually grab the token of fidelity down there in order to join the Way of the Blue if you want to use Targray as a merchant and uh, grab some of his infinite bolt stones early game. Aside from that, I don't see too many reasons why they have that there, but it is something if you want to be joining the Covenant, or just are collecting all the achievements. But that's all for this episode. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll actually see you all next time. Bye-bye.